Okay, so next reaction is the Martial Art History by Amy Johnson to episode 1 through 10. I know it's going to be longer than I thought, but we'll manage to take long, so bear with me if I react to it without doing some editing if I can. So um, I apologize to each and every YouTubers out there who actually, you know, thought it was boring. Hey, if you don't like it, then don't come to my channel. Alright, so, if you do like it, sit here, sit back, and relax, and just grab your popcorn, and, you know, listen to the martial arts history from Amy Johnson to episode 1 to 10. Here we go. In 3, 2, 1... Go. What's up everyone, I'm Amy Johnson and welcome to my new series, Martial Arts History. I'm an actress, stuntwoman, and lifelong martial artist and I love everything action and martial arts related so I'll be dedicating a specific martial art to each episode and I will be going in depth into the history of that martial art. The martial art for today's episode is karate. So karate means empty hand, karate do meaning the way of the empty hand, kara meaning empty, tei meaning hand, and do meaning way, the way of the empty hand. So karate is a form of martial arts that originated in Japan and is actually one of the most widely practiced forms of fighting in the world. Karate is an unarmed martial arts form that uses kicking, striking, and defensive stances using the arms and the legs. Students of karate are called karatikas. They practice hard and are able to reach different levels of mastering the form. The skill levels are determined through the color of the belt that the students wear, which typically in increasing order of skills are white belt, yellow, orange, green, blue, brown, and black. And typically there's 10 degrees of black belt. And even though there's no record of exactly where karate originated from, its occurrence was first noted in the Okinawan lands. In its early time, it was heavily influenced by Kung Fu. The reason not much written evidence exists regarding karate in its early times is because Japanese soldiers had actually banned the practice among civilians. However, at the start of the 20th century, karate actually started to be taught in schools. The art was brought to Japan by Sensei Gichin Funakashi, who made many changes to the form and was very instrumental in forming the Japanese Karate Association. The formation of JKA also spread the word of karate as they sent teachers internationally to teach it. Fortunately today, karate schools exist in all countries, so millions of people are able to practice the form of karate. If the philosophical aspects of karate are focused, it typically addresses emotions, physical strength, respecting one another, and being humble. Funakashi believed that karate, with all its physically strengthening lessons, could actually help an individual find mental strength and humble oneself. This helps improve one's skills as an individual may then be able to receive criticism and work on his or her faults. Many karate masters have learned the techniques of the fighting form and then later went on to teach it. However, some of them will never be known as they only taught in secrecy. Takahara Pichin was one of the most famous students of Tode Sakugawa, who was also known as the father of Okinawan karate. Other karate masters also include Soken Bushi Matsumura, who was one of the early teachers of Gichin, who was also trained by Yasutsune Azato. Gichin Funakashi was born frail, according to his words, and started karate in an attempt to improve his health. By the 1920s, Gichin had introduced karate into Japanese universities as part of the curriculum that also played a huge part in spreading karate to a larger audience. More recently, Sensei Hidetaka Nishiyama, who trained under Gichin, eventually became a member of the board of directors of the JKA, and also authored one of the most popular books about Shotokan karate called Karate, the Art of Empty Hand Fighting. 
Other masters have also had a great impact on the world of karate, such as Sensei Taiji Kase, Sensei Teruyuki Okazaki, and Shihan Hirakazu Kanazawa, who is the only living master to still hold the rank of 10th Don. Karate's had its influence in so many TV shows and movies throughout time. The Karate Kid in 1984, The Karate Kid Part 2 in 86, those were huge films that primarily brought karate to the big screen. Then of course there's Jackie Chan, who still to this day is practicing karate amongst many other martial arts and has always brought his martial arts to the big screen. Other films like Kill Bill, which is still one of my favorite films to this day. I absolutely love Quentin Tarantino as a director and that film was just absolutely awesome. That portrayed a lot of karate as well as Karate Kid in 2010. So karate is around everywhere. It's been in films and TV shows for years and it's not going anywhere. There are a ton of books on karate teaching some of the techniques and history of the martial arts such as the 20 guiding principles of karate, karate do, my way of life, and many more. Karate clearly involves a lot of techniques and clear understanding of the fighting form, which is why it requires an average of five years to earn a black belt. The techniques include stances, AKA dachi, that include natural, straddle, forward, and back stance. Punching techniques known as suki include rising, middle, downward, lunge, reverse, you punch, and spear hand thrust punch. The striking techniques include back fist, bottom fist, knife hand, and elbow strike. Upper rising, middle outside, middle inside, knife hand, and downward blocks are some of the types of blocking techniques. And finally, the kicking techniques involve front, roundhouse, back, side, thrust, and snap. There are so many other karate techniques, but those are some of the basic and most commonly used. Now, from school to school, the names often change, so there can be one technique with several different names. It's not uncommon. Karate, despite being a form of exercise for the body, also aims to strengthen the character and mental strength of those who practice it. The strength and discipline and patience required to practice karate can prepare one for almost every obstacle in life as your concentration and focus gets a lot better as well. Once the practitioner has made a commitment to include these values as a daily part of their life, it will lead to an inevitable improvement in one's character. All right, everyone, that's it for today. I know it was a lot of information, but I hope that you learned something. Stay tuned to next week's episode for a different style of martial arts. Thanks so much for watching Martial Arts History, and I'll see you next week. for me? Really? Hey everyone, it's Amy Johnston and welcome back to another episode of Martial Arts History. So in this series, I go in depth into the history of several different martial arts styles. The martial art for today is Tai Chi. Before we get started, I just want to say that I don't know everything. I've been doing martial arts for a very long time, but that does not make me a master in any particular art. So this is just things that I have learned and things that I want to share with you that I think are cool. So with that said, I don't know everything. So if I miss something that you want to add, please do leave your comments down below and we can just create this huge martial arts nerd fest in the comment sections and learn from one another. So let's get started on today's episode of Tai Chi. Tai Chi means Grand Ultimate Fist, and it's actually a form of moving Qigong. Qigong is cultivating energy. Tai Chi is a form of martial arts whose principles rely on integrating the functioning of the mind and the body as one. It's a graceful and gentle exercise which can be used to better one's lifestyle and defensive skills. In Tai Chi and Eastern philosophy, it's important to be in harmony with oneself and the universe. So there are several styles of Tai Chi, but they all trace back to the Chen village. The styles are Yang, Wu, Wu Hao, Chen, and Sun. While Tai Chi is known for its slow movement, Yang, Wu, and Chen 
tend to carry a faster pace, which is why I think that they are a little bit more popular. Tai Chi is a renowned form of martial arts, which originated around 1670 in China. It was based on Qigong and other techniques. This form of martial arts gained attention as it could be served as a form of fighting as well as exercise. Its origins can be accredited to Zhang Sanfeng, who was a Taoist monk. Tai Chi can be hailed as a practice that pushes the boundaries of how one thinks and perceives. It challenges the hierarchy and rituals meant for us to follow. Tai Chi has spread all over the world and has been embraced as a form of exercise for spiritual enhancement. In the early 20th century, Yang Chen Fu began teaching Tai Chi in the United States. Since then, Tai Chi has gained a lot of popularity for its easy and less stressful methods and became part of a regime for elderly people to exercise. It's even been adopted by hospitals and nurseries, which I think is awesome. Training for Tai Chi or Tai Chi Xuan requires understanding of the five elements that it constitutes. Tao Lu is a solo open hand or weapon form. Nigong and Qigong are meditation, so breathing and awareness. Tui Xiao are response drills and and Sancho are self-defense movements. A combination of all these elements is the essence of Tai Chi. Tai Chi's philosophy is of non-violence. It teaches its students that meeting violence with violence is only catastrophic and will most likely result in collateral damage, which is something I think that we can all learn from. The art lies in using slow motions and gentleness as an alternative to the opponent's aggression until they tire out and we can redirect their attack safely. The commonly heard yin, yang, or vice versa is the primary goal of teaching Tai Chi, to meet one force with its complete opposite. Lao Tzu provided the gist for Tai Chi when he wrote, the soft and the pliable will defeat the herd and strong. Tai Chi teaches that enhancing one's inner qi will improve health and prolong life. Enhancing qi requires learning specific breathing techniques and movements. To gain access to Tai Chi's health benefits doesn't necessarily require an in-depth research into Chinese philosophy, rather a person should just understand the concept of Tai Chi to better his or her approach to this form of martial arts. Tai Chi is based on two components. One is Qi, which is thought to be a force of energy that flows through your body. You want to unlock your inner Qi. The second component is Yin and Yang. As previously stated, these are opposite elements that exist in our universe and that need to be in balance for optimum results in life. So there are five elements that form the life and health cycle. They're all related to different organs, different emotions, colors. They are water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. After the Chinese Civil War, the Chinese government wanted to promote Tai Chi and incorporate it into the Wushu competitions. The different forms of Tai Chi were amalgamated into one form known as the competition form. In the 1950s, another form was created, which was the 97 movements combined. These modern takes on Tai Chi Xuan have become an important part of international competitions. Tai Chi, due to its slow and deliberate motions, has been incorporated as a relaxing and meditative exercise, which is why it's widely practiced by many celebrities in Hollywood as well. The most prominent Tai Chi scene in film that comes to mind for me is Roadhouse, when Patrick Swayze is doing Tai Chi on the beach. It's a very memorable scene. He's got his shirt off. It's a great scene. <laughs> and then there's Tai Chi Master, Man of Tai Chi, Tai Chi Zero, Tai Chi Hero. Also, I'm gonna say that I think the philosophy of Tai Chi was incorporated into The Matrix. I actually think that's in several movies. Like the basic idea of being in harmony with everything around you and yourself and harnessing your inner energy or Chi. There are so many books that have been written about Tai Chi. The most popular book being Chen Su's 13 Treatises on Tai Chi Xuan. Tai Chi has proven to have numerous medical benefits on aging and health. It's an ancient practice of integrating mind and body movements. As previously mentioned, Tai Chi gained popularity due to its potential of releasing stress and its benefits don't stop there. It also improves the body's immune system, eases chronic muscle pain, and improves a person's efficiency when exercising. Tai Chi infuses the spiritual and physical aspects of life with perfect harmony and that is why it is rightfully a renowned form of martial arts. So I haven't studied too much Tai Chi or Qigong, but it's something that I really want to focus on because I know the times that I have 
Dan Chi Gong uh, with my mom who teaches Tai Chi and Qi Gong, um, I feel so centered and aware after class and maybe I'm crazy but the colors seem brighter like my body really gets into a relaxed state by connecting certain breathing techniques with movements along with visualization. Tai Chi, Qigong, breathing techniques or any form of meditation is so powerful and I think so important so actually creating this episode on Tai Chi is getting me really inspired to go do some Tai Chi right now actually maybe I will after I film this video. We don't always breathe perfectly and I know that sounds weird because obviously we have to breathe to live um, but because we're not always paying attention to our breath we might be holding our breath a lot of times and that can cause stress in the body which causes tension which can eventually cause injury so it is so important to breathe properly get that time to relax whatever it is for you actually it might not be tai chi qigong meditation it's so important to get your body into that relaxed state as much as you possibly can Okay, well I'm absolutely inspired to go do some Tai Chi now, so I'm gonna get out of here. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Please make sure to tune in to next week's episode. Remember, like I said, if you wanted to add anything that I missed, please leave your comments down below and we can start up that nice martial arts nerd fest that I spoke about earlier, and I just can't wait to hear from you. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and if you have, go ahead and hit that notification bell. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't overpay for Best Buy. Wikibuy can save you money. It's a browser extension. Hey everyone, it's Amy Johnston and welcome back to another episode of Martial Arts History. series I take different styles of martial arts and I go in depth into the history of them and like I've said before if there's something that I missed that you think is cool please do add it in the comments uh, these are just things that I want to share with you that I've learned throughout the years or that I just think are worth sharing the martial art for today is Muay Thai so the first thing I want to share with you is a story actually that my dad told me several times and has just stuck with me um, in regards to Muay Thai so my dad was a five-time world kickboxing champion and he told me that the first time that he fought in Thailand, he was going against the Thai champ there and obviously he was the underdog, he was an American in Thailand and he was warming up and getting ready for his fight in his locker room and he said that the ground started shaking. I don't know if he's exaggerating um, because he was quite the storyteller, but he said the ground started shaking and he heard boom, boom, boom. And he was like, what is that? What is that? You know, and nobody really knew what was going on. And so he looked over, like walked around the corner into another area um, and he saw his opponent, the Thai challenger, the world champion Thai boxer, kicking with his shins against a pole, a cement pole. And it was shaking the cement pole like boom, boom, and there was like dust coming down, and um, that was before my dad fought him. My dad actually won that fight, but uh, like what, that, <laughs> I'll never forget that story. And it just reminds me of like the hard work that goes into Muay Thai and Thai boxing, the dedication and those armored legs, man, ridiculous. So anyways, I wanted to share that story with you because every time I think of Muay Thai, I, I think of my dad telling me that story. Um, like, what does that do to your mindset before you get into the fight? Like, pfft, I would be running. Anyways, let's get started into more educational things on Muay Thai. So Muay Thai actually means Thai boxing and it's often referred to as the art of eight limbs or the science of eight limbs and that's because there are not four points of contact, um, there are eight points of contact. So, you know, in boxing, there are two points of contact, your left and your right. 
kickboxing, there's four, your left punch, right punch, left kick, round kick. Well, there are eight in Muay Thai, so punch, punch, kick, kick, and then there's elbow, elbow, knee, knee. So eight points of contact in Muay Thai. What comes to my mind often when thinking about Muay Thai fighters is the dance that they do uh, before they fight. And there's actually a name for that. It's called the Y Crew or the Ram Y. So there's two different names for it. It's a traditional dance that signifies respect to their teachers. And also for some, it's just a nice time to kind of show off some of their movements. And some fighters are more religious, giving thanks to whoever they believe in or what they believe in, um, but ultimately it's a tradition to express gratitude and give thanks. So the headpiece the Muay Thai fighters usually wear is called a monkle and the armband is called a prajan. So the headband and armband are usually given to the fighter after they've been blessed by Buddhist monks and the point of this is to give victory and protection to the fighter. So Muay Thai is a sport that includes stand-up striking alongside clinching techniques. The sport makes use of one's full body, including one's fists, elbows, knees, and shins. Those who practice the art of Muay Thai have usually started from the age of six years old and have taken their first fight by eight years old. As this sport is very harsh on those who practice it, the fighters are known to have super tough bodies and are able to tolerate pain a little more because they worked really hard on building up that tolerance. The popularity of Muay Thai has really risen and has recently been accepted as an Olympic sport. The origins of Muay Thai are debated over as most of Muay Thai's history was lost when Burmese took over Siam, which is now Thailand. Muay Thai was taught to soldiers. If they lost their weapon on the battlefield, they were then actually able to use their whole body as a weapon. Since there was a constant threat of battle, many training centers began to open throughout the kingdom to assist men in being able to defend themselves. Apart from its popularity amongst the common people, it even became required for royalty to practice Muay Thai. It was believed that Muay Thai would help them become better leaders. King Narswan was a Muay Thai legend and would eventually help free Thailand from the Burmese. One of the most famous Thai fighters is named Somart Payakarun, who some also call the Muhammad Ali of Muay Thai. His achievements include a boxing record of 21-2, he has four lumpeny belts, and also he is a WBC super bantamweight champion. Another fighter by the name of Diasel Noi Chor Thanasakarn used his weight as an advantage and was often able to execute a very effective knee strike which helped him to become an undefeated lumpeny stadium champion. Sanchez's techniques as an agile and smart fighter earn him a right to be mentioned alongside the best fighters as well. Despite his short stature, his brilliance is displayed during his fights and at 33 years of age shows no signs of slowing down. Tang Chai Torsalache, Kansak Sor Planchet, and Nankabuan Nongki Paya Youth are some of the other champions to have mastered Muay Thai techniques. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing these names right, they're really difficult to pronounce. One of the most well-known trainers of the sport is Yad Tong Sananam, who has trained seven Muay Thai champions. He actually owns a camp in Thailand where he trains a lot of UFC and K1 professionals. Muay Thai has had its influence in film, television, anime, manga, video games. So Dual Fist comes to mind as a reference to Muay Thai. It's a Shaw Brothers film that was uh, made in the 70s. Also, the Ong Bak films, those are really popular. Tony Ja really brought Muay Thai to a big audience and I think from there it just became more and more popular and then there's other films like Muay Thai Chaya and A Prayer Before Dawn and several others it's often that there's a Muay Thai character in a video game or a movie like even in one of my films Lady Blood Fight in the Kumite we had a Muay Thai fighter her name is Sunny and she actually is a Muay Thai fighter so that was really cool and then of course there's Muay Thai and Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat it's it's all over the place. A lot of MMA legends consider Muay Thai to be a very effective and crucial fighting method. Muay Thai includes the use of fists, elbows, knees, feet, and even shins to have a diverse number of moves under one's belt. Roundhouse kicks, low kicks, uh, they're all very effective. The elbow is such a strong tool when used properly. The clinch is a super important technique because it helps restrict the opponent so that you can have more control in the fight, obviously. Mastering the techniques can really also help an individual's health and fitness as the sport burns a lot of calories. Honestly, 
Training Muay Thai is one of my favorite exercises ever because it is so empowering. If you've never tried Muay Thai, I would highly suggest taking a class, even if it's just like a fitness Muay Thai class. Go hit some pads, release some of that stress from your busy day. Muay Thai is super effective from a fighting perspective, and it's also really great to know a little bit of self-defense. Hopefully you never need to use it, but you know, if you do, um, Muay Thai teaches you to use all of your limbs. You're using your whole body as a weapon and I think it's extremely effective. So I really recommend you try Muay Thai out. It's important to note that Muay Thai, like so many other martial arts styles, test an individual in so many different ways that can only strengthen the character and spirit of oneself, which contributes positively in being able to face every obstacle that comes your way. All right, everyone, that's it for the Muay Thai episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and please leave your comments down below letting me know how you like the video and also anything you wanted to add, like I said before. If you haven't subscribed, please do so now, and if you have subscribed, go ahead and hit that notification bell. And if you haven't subscribed to my email list, go ahead and do that now. I'll leave a link down below for you. And by being a part of the email list, you will receive a lot of cool VIP treatment and early access to things. Uh, for example, I just gave 25 free pages of my new book, How to Stunt in Hollywood, to all my email subscribers. And I actually gave that to them a week before the book was even released. So if you wanna stay updated on everything and get some VIP content and early access, go ahead and subscribe to my email list. Like I said, there's a link down below for you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't overpay for Adidas. Wikibuy can save you money. It's a browser extension at Autumn. Hey everyone, it's Amy Johnston. Thank you so much for tuning back in to another episode of Martial Arts History. So if you're just tuning in to this series, basically what I do is I take different martial arts styles and I go in depth into the history of those styles. And like I've told everyone before, if there's something I miss uh, that you wanted to add, please leave your comments down below. I would love to hear from you. Because again, all the information in this video is just stuff that I've learned throughout the years and things that I wanna share with you. So please feel free to leave your comments and add any additional information that you want in the comment section. The martial art for today's episode is our niece. Our niece is a form of martial arts that's also known as two other names, Kali or Eskrima. This form of martial arts originated in the Philippines and centers around the concept of fighting with weapons, mainly bladed weapons, sticks, and in some places the emphasis is on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mainly, our niece is taught to help individuals protect themselves against weapons that are easily accessible. Arnis definitely requires an individual to be using their body as a whole unit and all of their movements to coordinate with each other. This practice really enhances one's coordination. As speed is not a crucial factor in Arnis, any age can practice at their own pace. The practice of Arnis was originated in the Philippines by Spanish soldiers, which actually took inspiration from fencing. This practice was really common amongst peasants, and as most of those practitioners lacked education, not much written record exists. A record of Arnis exists only after the arrival of the Spanish. In 1521, the use of Arnis was first recorded when the chief of Mactan, Datu Lapu Lapu, defeated Ferdinand Magellan by Kali. However, during the 18th century, Spanish banned the learning of Arnis by the civilians actually fearing that there was going to be a rebellious outrage if the population learned how to arm themselves. However, the natives continued to practice in secrecy, during which time the name Escrima was coined to refer to Arnis. Grandmaster Porfirio Lanada is not only internationally recognized, but is also the founder of Arnis Lanada, which is a recognized Filipino stick fighting style. His name appears in the 1988 Martial Arts Hall of Fame, and he has more than 50 years of experience in martial arts. He's also published a book alongside his student, Amante Marinas, which was the first book about Arnis. 
Remy Pressis, another martial arts teacher whose name appears in the 82 and 94 Black Belt Hall of Fame as Instructor of the Year, is well known for introducing modern Arnis to the general people. He merged basic concepts from various martial arts systems to create his own system. Modern Arnis was approved by the Philippine Amateur Athletic Federation and was to be taught at National College of Physical Education. More recently, Arnis has become a huge part of pop culture since the recognition of martial arts as a valid sport and technique. Arnis is very valuable when training actors for action films or, you know, stunt men and stunt women practicing because a lot of the movements that you learn in Arnis can transfer really well into several other weapons. So Arnis is always something that I suggest to people when they want to learn more weapon-based combat. Arnis is really great for action films, in my opinion, because there's so much you can do with it and there's so many different weapons you can use. And it's fast and strong and clean and beautiful all in one. A documentary by the name Escrimadors was directed by Kerwin Go. The movie includes interviews from various schools in the Cebu area. It also includes the origin of Arnis from the 13th century all the way until the modern era. Arnis's self-defense teaching includes multiple moves that are designed to do exactly that defend. It includes moves ranging and including low kicks, elbow and knee strikes, and disarming techniques against knife, stick, gun, and so many other weapons. San Miguel is a right-handed forehand strike that can be used by most amateurs as well. The Sinwali is a signature move that uses double sticks in a continuously moving pattern that requires immense concentration and coordination. I personally love Sinwali and I always teach Sinwali to people that want to learn more weapon skills. It's really great mentally, and it's also a really good workout for your arms. Redonda, <laughs> literally meaning round, basically describes a signature move that includes constant circular stick movements that whip around in a circle and come back to its origin. Arnis, as mentioned before, is a defensive technique that all in all has various systems and types ranging from traditional to modern Arnis. Arnis stands out amongst other types of martial arts as it doesn't emphasize the need to fight. Once the opponent has been disarmed and has surrendered, it is then completely up to the Arnisador on how to move forward, and with great power comes great responsibility. This is something that I really love about Arnis is that it's so powerful mm -hmm. because once you learn how to disarm somebody, you're putting them at a complete disadvantage and you're making them vulnerable because they weren't expecting that. So this practice itself shows the need for creating more awareness for techniques that don't instigate or encourage the use of violence, but rather a way to teach individuals the way to defend themselves from probable harm. I think Arnis is a really great defensive martial art, and again, like I said, it's really wonderful if you're trying to learn some more weapon-based combat. Again, a lot of the weapon work that you will learn in Arnis really transfers well into several other weapons, so I highly recommend it. It really challenges you mentally because a lot of techniques you're using your right hand to do one thing, your left hand to do another thing and then your feet are doing something completely different and you have to switch things up on the fly and be very aware of your opponent, the sensitivity levels, and how your body is moving in its entirety. So it's really great for your mind and it's also a really good workout and super, super fun. I recommend anyone of any age to go take an Arnie's class. I don't think you'll regret it. The awareness and sensitivity that you can gain from Arnie's is really incredible and so important as a martial artist. All right, everyone, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed, and please, like I said, go ahead and leave your comments down below. Let me know what you thought and add any additional information if you'd like to. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do so now, and if you have, go ahead and hit that notification bell. Last thing, if you're not subscribed to my email list, Go ahead and do that now. The link is down below, super simple. Basically, it will keep you updated on everything that I'm doing. You'll receive VIP and early access content, and actually, you'll get my first 25 pages of my new book for free. That book is called How to Stunt in Hollywood. It's a very inspirational book. I recommend it to anyone. It's actually available on the Amazon Kindle store. If anyone is interested, I would love to hear your feedback. So go ahead and subscribe to my email list if you are interested in those free 25 pages and early access and VIP content. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.
Don't overpay for Best Buy. Wikibuy can save you money. It's a browser extension that automatically applies coupon. Hey everyone, welcome back to Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is boxing. So boxing is a really well-known martial art and sport in which many of you know uh, boxers will wear padded gloves, usually 10 ounce gloves to fight their opponent with just their hands. Um, the lighter weights usually use the eight ounce gloves. So boxing matches are fought in rounds and the maximum would be 12 rounds for professional boxers. And actually in the early 20th century, it was super common for boxers to have unlimited rounds, which is just crazy to me. So now thankfully, there are you know more rules in the sport. Boxing is an Olympic game as well as part of the Commonwealth Games, including both men and women. It also has its own separate world championships. Some of the earliest occurrences of boxing actually go way back to the Roman era, during which soldiers would lose their weapons and need to learn how to fight with their fists. So it was kind of a do or die situation. So one of the early reasons to why boxing became so popular is because the Greek Olympic competition in the eighth century Century actually included boxing as a sport. However, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, not much was seen of boxing. But during the Age of Enlightenment, a lot of people became interested in boxing and brought boxing back up to the surface, made it relevant again. Boxing actually became very popular in London in the mid 1700s, during which time they started to create rules and regulations for the sport. John Broughton um, created his own set of rules for boxing matches and those eventually became the official rules. And when these rules were introduced, weight classes uh, were then introduced as well, which is so important because weight plays such an important factor, right? Thanks to the London Prize ring rules, the weight classes kept evolving and thankfully now we have 17 different weight classes as opposed to just two weight classes. <laughs> the sport has had so many great athletes, um, many of which you know. One of the most popular, of course, is Muhammad Ali. To this day, he is still considered to be one of the best boxers of all time. Apart from him, there are so many other greats, such as Sugar Ray Robinson, who was the welterweight champion for five years. And then, of course, there's Joe Lewis, Henry Armstrong, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, of course, Sugar Ray Leonard, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. The list goes on, and you probably know several other famous boxers and well-known boxers throughout history. There are so many. More recently, there's you know Floyd Mayweather, who I consider to be one of the best athletes there is. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like how Floyd Money Mayweather uh, talks, but to me, it's a part of it. You know, he knows how to get people in the seats, and he puts on a show and he backs it up. I think he's very smart and makes good business moves. And then of course there's Manny Pacquiao. There are so many great professionals in the sport, and it's always really exciting to watch. So due to the popularity of boxing, many movies were created off of you know boxing premises or ideas. And obviously, I think the most notable film or films. Um, would be Rocky, right? With Sylvester Stallone, as you know. You know, people reenact the film all the time. There's so many quotable lines and, um, you know, if you've ever been to the stairs in which uh, Rocky runs up and does, yeah, at the top, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. So I recently went to Philadelphia and I uh, went to those stairs. I saw so many people running up those stairs thinking they were Rocky, being so inspired. They even had, like, some people had their music on. Um, and it was amazing to see people become so inspired by that film, you know? Like I said, people reenact it all the time, so many quotable lines. But I think seeing all those people run up the stairs and like be inspired by this film and be inspired by Rocky made me realize that much more how impactful films are and specifically Rocky. Obviously, Rocky was amazing, it still is, it holds up to this day. And then another film, which is actually like in my top five favorite films of all time is Million Dollar Baby with Hilary Swank and Clint Eastwood. I think it's such a beautiful story and so inspirational and moving. And then, you know, more recently, there's films like Southpaw and Creed. And then there's some famous books about boxing. The Fight by Norman Mailer, The Greatest by Walter Dean Myers. And then there's others like The Sweet Science by A.J. Liebling. There's so many different books and films and shows where you can 
see boxing or learn about boxing. Boxing requires so much discipline, finesse, and hard work. So it's not just training to be good physically and be able to, you know, defeat your opponent physically. There's also a huge mental aspect. You have to understand the rules. You have to really try to understand your opponent and get in his or her head. There's so many technical aspects to boxing. So it's not just about the physicality. There is so much more. I have a question for you, actually. What do you think is more important in a fight or a sparring match? Uh, timing or speed? Time versus speed. What do you think? So leave your comments down below. I really want to know what you have to say um, because I had a debate uh, with several friends that turned into this big thing like a few years ago. Um, so I'm not gonna give my opinion on it yet. I want to hear what you have to say. Timing versus speed, which one is more important? Obviously boxers come from you know different backgrounds. They have different body types. So they have all different types of techniques. You know, there's like the brawler fighter who is very aggressive and maybe doesn't have the most perfect technique, um, but usually gets the job done. And there's the more technical person who um, is more of like a counter puncher, you know, really weighing in on the, the fighter, their opponent, and um, reacting to their actions. If you have two opponents that are very technical, it may be more of a, a slow match, but for me, it's really exciting just to watch uh, very technical fighters. And obviously it's also exciting to see brawlers, but I prefer the more technical. So there are several different techniques in boxing. The jab in my mind is one of the most important punches because with the jab, you are keeping them busy and you're also keeping that distance. Um, it feels like you're in control a little bit more. You're setting up your next punch you're also finding the timing and distance with that jab. And then of course there's the cross, the hook, the uppercut, and the overhand. Um, they're all very, very important. And um, you know, when put together in combinations is what makes it so interesting. And then moving around with the feet and really having good footwork is so important. So when all of that comes together really nicely and you blend your combinations up and you you know, try to figure out your other opponent. It's like this game of chess, right? And by using your whole body like that, it's truly such an amazing workout. Boxing is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. It is, you know, one of the first martial arts and sports, and it's so enjoyable to watch. The idea of people fighting each other doesn't sound the greatest. Um, but boxing, to me, in my mind, is two opponents using their skills that they've been working very hard at to play this game of chess with each other. And it's very interesting to watch when you understand um, that they're not just attacking each other. There's so much thought and training that goes into every move that they make, or at least there should be. So in my mind, because boxing is not just full of aggression, there's also a huge technical side of it. I think that's what makes it one of the most enjoyable sports to watch. And it might be the reason that it's actually one of the most highly viewed sports in the world. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to leave your comments down below. I wanna know if you think timing or speed is most important. I'm gonna throw out one more question, actually. Who is your favorite boxer and why? Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And if you have, go and hit the notification bell. And if you wanna to subscribe to my email list, there's a link for you down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. soap you shower with, it's because I'll let you in on a little industry seat. Hey everyone, welcome back to Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is Penchok Salat. I've trained a lot of Salat um, under the progressive style of which my dad taught, um, but I never really got into Penchok Salat too much until I actually worked with a master named Chechup, who was in the Raid 2. Uh, he was against Eco, uh, doing a cool fight scene in the kitchen with the knives, really awesome fight scene. I um, got to fight Chechup in a short film called The Gate, and during that project, I actually learned some Penchok Salat, 
um, and it's, learn uh, more about yeah. the history of it. And I absolutely love it. I think it's a beautiful art. Yeah, so I'm so excited to share some information about Penchok Salat today. It's a form of martial arts that originated in Indonesia. It's known to be a competitive form of Salat. It's a type of full body fighting that includes a lot of different striking techniques, um, grappling, and the use of many weapons. Every part of your body is used while striking or in defense. Um, it's something I really like about the art is that it's so creative in um, the defensive moves and the striking moves. You are moving in a way that feels very natural um, and it might feel weird in the beginning but once you do it it feels very natural um, in my opinion so i love the fact that you're using these very natural movements and using all of your body to defend and attack so according to a different myth um, in regards to the origin of penchak salat the evidence of when it really began to become an art was in the sixth century originally it was developed by tribal groups who actually observed animals in nature um, defending themselves against other animals Eventually, it became very influential in achieving social status, meaning that there were fights between clans, tribal groups, communities, and later on, kingdoms. In between the 7th and the 14th century, two kingdoms of Sumatra and Srivijaya, and between the 13th to the 16th century, Majapahit in Java had contributed to the development of Penchak Salat by making good use of its fighting skills, and then were successful in extending their rules in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. This martial art, Penchak Salat, is associated with a lot of religious concepts, local legends, religions, philosophies, and customary law systems. It also has a very deep spiritual and mental aspect to develop oneself. Its art and cultural aspects are a huge part in describing the martial art in terms of music, the dances, and the beautiful dresses. And it's also been a huge form of character building. So there are four major aspects in this martial art. The first one is the spiritual aspect, uh, having faith. Second is self-defense, having the ability to know how to protect yourself and also stay in peak physical shape and understanding so you can do so. The third is the art aspect, which is being able to perform your martial art. And fourth is the sports aspect, which is to have a competitive mindset and desire to live a healthy life and keep moving forward. So these aspects also bring so many amazing things to the practitioners, such as moral values, discipline, honesty, and responsibilities. In Indonesia, Salat is considered to be a cultural heritage and is practiced with the mindset of being able to adjust and adapt to your situation and environment, which I absolutely love because there's you know, there are a lot of martial arts and movements that you can learn and you might be able to, you know, do it when you're all set and prepared in the right environment and happy tunes are going on and everything, but to be able to adapt in any situation is one of the most important skills. So Dan Inosanto, he's well known for Salat, so I have to throw him in there, of course. He's an absolute legend in the world of martial arts. The Penchak Salat practitioners that are more well known today would be the actors and martial artists in films like The Raid you know, such as Iko Weiss, Chechep Arif Rahman, who, like I said, I worked with and he was incredible. If you haven't watched The Gate short film, please do so. It's it's a really good short film. <laughs> um, I'm not being biased. I just think it's a really, really good action drama piece. And then there's Yayan, Ruhian, and many others who, you know, not only practice the art, but are becoming well known for uh, being action stars or being Penchok Salat masters. So Penchok is the performance aspect of Salat. Salat is the spirit, self-defense, and fighting techniques. So together it creates Penchok Salat. More recently, Penchok Salat has actually been taught in schools as extracurricular activities in Indonesia, which I love. It's also included in national, local, and international events like Indonesia Sports Week and SEA Games. In 2002, Salat was introduced at the Asian Games in Korea. Influence of Penchok Salat and Salat Salat in general can be seen in so many different martial arts films, films in general, shows, it's all over the place. And in my opinion, some of the most notable films um, that had some cool Penchak Salat in it would be Marantau, which is a really awesome action film, The Raid, The Raid 2. These films and this way of fighting is becoming much more popular and I think the US is finally starting to understand how cool it can be. And you know, I think The Raid really brought Penchak Salat to American viewers and you know, more and more shows and directors and producers are trying to capture that style 
um, because it just looks awesome and it looks real, you know? So love this style, it's amazing. It's in so many different films, um, but those are definitely a few of the top Penchoxalot films. Overall, there's no standard set of moves in Penchoxalot. Each style has its own specific movements and techniques. That's because, you know, several different masters um, interpreted it in their own way and put their style on that. And, you know, now we have several different techniques and different styles and variations of those techniques, which I think is awesome. I mean, I love that aspect of martial arts. I don't think anything can ever truly remain the same. I think things are there to evolve and adapt and become better. It's so important to add your own style to any martial art that you do and find what works best for you. Strict rules don't always work the best in my opinion because everybody's body is different, we all move differently. Um, so find what is right for you and adapt and change and just like pen chocks a lot. Um, try to be as adaptable as possible. And in my opinion, that just comes from being aware in general and practicing as much as possible. So the techniques differ because of the different masters who interpreted it in their own way for their preferences, their socio-culture context, and the physical environment that surrounded them. So even the basic attacking techniques may differ depending on lineage, style, and regional origin. Some of the most popular techniques are obviously punches and kicks. There are a lot of takedowns, sweeps, uh, they use elbows a lot, a lot of locks and joint manipulation, and overall using their whole body as a weapon, like I said before, that is one of the coolest things about Penchak's a lot is that, you know, because they studied these animals in the past and it was kind of developed by watching how these animals naturally move and defend themselves, um, they then figured out what felt best for them based off of what those animals were doing. So a lot of the movements feel very natural. Um, and very powerful. Penchoxalot is one of my new favorite martial arts because it's so addictive. It just feels so good to practice. Um, I highly recommend it. If you haven't studied any salat in general, I would absolutely do that. Really great techniques, uh, wonderful workouts, and uh, you know, if you ever want to work in film, I would definitely start studying um, salat and even penchoxalot because it's just an awesome art. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And again, if you haven't watched the Gate short film with Chechup, um, where we use some Penchox a lot, uh, go ahead and do that. It's a really fun short film. I'll leave the link for you down below. Of course, subscribe if you haven't, and if you have, hit the notification bell. If you wanna to subscribe to my email list, I will have a link for you down below. And leave your comments down below. You know I love hearing from you. And of course, if you have any additional information on Penchox a lot, Let's get it out there. Let's put it out there so we can all learn from each other. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, welcome back to Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do. So Wing Chun is actually a traditional form of Kung Fu, which specializes in close counter combat. It includes several striking techniques and is mainly a defensive art. Wing Chun was originated um, to be used in close quarters where there was cramped space and not much room to move. The idea was to be able to defend yourself in a small area. Wing Chun relies on three basic principles that include defense and counterattacking simultaneously, keeping moves simple and straight to the point, and also emphasizing to strike at major pressure points. JKD or Jeet Kune Do is the form of martial arts that was given to Bruce Lee's art. The core idea behind Wing Chun is to be able to intercept the opponent's attacks and their intents. Wing Chun spread through China during the Qing Dynasty and not so much written record exists but it is thought to have been named after a woman who had the same name. JKD or Jeet Kune Do is fairly new and only came into existence as an actual form in 1969. Bruce Lee, of course, was against naming the art because he wanted to avoid 
limiting the art's flexibility. The first known Wing Chun master was Yip Man. I'm sure you've seen the movies. If you haven't, please go see the movies. They're so cool. Yip Man taught to his students in Hong Kong, and his son Yip Chun has also continued to teach Wing Chun as passionately as his father, and eventually was appointed chairman of the Bing Sun Athletic Association, which was originally founded by Yip Man himself. Another one of Yip Man's students was the famous Mo Yat, who taught Wing Chun in New York and was considered by Kung Fu Magazine to be one of the greatest martial arts instructors of all time. Alongside such notable students, Bruce Lee, of course, was another student of Yip Man. And then, you know, Bruce Lee went on from then to create JKD and bring all of his styles and techniques that he had learned uh, together to make it form into his style. Richard Bustillo was actually one of Bruce Lee's students who was quite the specialist in JKD. A close friend and trainer to Bruce Lee, uh, his name is Dan Inosanto, I'm sure you've heard of him. He became the most trusted source of history and facts regarding Jeet Kune Do. Wing Chun, of course, has had its presence in so many films, most notably Yip Man, and again, if you haven't seen those films, please do watch those. Very exciting, awesome action, really well done. There were multiple other documentaries based off of Yip Man's life uh, that are really interesting as well. Regarding Jeet Kune Do, though, Bruce Lee's name itself had a great impact on the popularity of the art. As as Bruce Lee started to teach in Oakland, it got more and more popular outside of Asia. There's so many celebrities that have stated that, you know, Bruce Lee was a huge inspiration in their life, and obviously martial artists always look up to Bruce Lee because he really brought um, theatrical performance of martial arts to the screen. And obviously he's, you know, one of my inspirations as well. You know, without him, who knows where martial arts on screen would be. The idea that people still talk about him and he's quoted all the time, you know, he made such a big impact in the world on martial artists, on so many people. So I think he did something right. Wing Chun, just like most other martial arts, require a lot of dedication and hard work to master the techniques. Wing Chun techniques are typically known for the speed and accuracy, as well as really focusing on countering your opponent. A few of the techniques are Pen Sao, Pak Sao, Hai Jarn, Lin Wan Quin, and the One Inch Punch are popular punching techniques. There are five original ways to attack, which are single direct attack, SDA, attack by combination, ABC, progressive indirect attack, PIA, and immobilization attack, HIA, and attack by drawing, ABD. Bing Chun and JKD have a ton of different techniques, most of which are defensive or countering your opponent. But what I really like about Wing Chun is the idea of just using your body simply. Like not putting too much force when you don't need to put force. You know, a lot of times when we think about punching or think about kicking, we're we hold our breath and we tighten up and we're like, all right, let's go. <laughs> um, obviously we shouldn't do that because when you're tense, you could possibly get injured and you're not going to actually um, give as much proper technique or force. So the idea is to relax like a whip, let your arm be a whip, you know, it's loose, but then it has a hard hit at the end. And so you want to relax as much as possible until that last second. Um, and that's what I really love about it. And also it just feels very natural. When I started studying a little bit of Wing Chun, um, I realized how natural it was to punch in that style once I kind of like broke all my habits of karate punching or, you know, sparring. Wing Chun is just one of those martial arts that feels so good to practice it. And the idea of, you know, learning the technique and then creating your own twist on it and making it yours. I think it's so important to not stay stuck on techniques being perfect. I think it's vital to create what's best for you um, and how your body feels and what you need. So I love that about JKD. So Wing Chun is such a great defensive martial art. I highly recommend it. Alright everyone, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to leave your comments and everything down below. I'd love to hear from you and if you have any additional information, please do add that. Go ahead and subscribe or hit that notification bell if you're already subscribed. And if you want to subscribe to my email list, there's a link for you down below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.
everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu is a form of martial arts that deals with a close counter situation, so most fights go to the ground. So I always recommend anybody to learn, um, you know, grappling, wrestling, jujitsu. It's so beneficial, especially for women. If you can learn how to be technical um, and smart about how you move in case you're ever in any situation that you don't want to be in, and obviously for men as well, it's really difficult sometimes when there are bigger opponents than you. But if you understand the technicalities of an art like jujitsu, you can really get out of some situations. So it's really an incredible art, and I'm so excited to share some information with you today. So it's a Japanese form of martial arts, and it's characterized by the use of little to no weapons. The name Jiu-Jitsu originated in the 17th century and then it gained global recognition for techniques uh, related to grappling or principles of grappling. This method of combat actually came about when the people wanted to fight back against the samurai when feudalism was at its peak. Ju in Jiu-Jitsu means soft, gentle, or flexible. And this meaning hints at one of the key elements in Jiu-Jitsu, which is disarming the opponent and using their own strengths against them. It was during the Sengoku time period, alongside the Miramachi time period that the idea of jujitsu was culminated. It was developed to serve the purpose of an effective means of defense um, in close combat on the battlefield. This was particularly useful um, in battles where weapons weren't present. Originally, jujitsu included Takenochi Ryu to help counterattack swords or knives. There was a shift in the social and political climate in the 17th century in Japan, and laws imposed meant that the use of weapons for destruction were being curtailed to reinforce an era of peace. And this was vital to establishing a form of combat that could still help a person defend themselves regardless of the use of a weapon. So what derived of this change is that jujitsu Jiu-Jitsu went on to expand the library of techniques, which aimed at inflicting specific areas of the body, um, most importantly, the upper body. And more striking techniques were introduced at that time as well. But when the 18th century came about, these techniques were actually considered obsolete, as they expended too much energy and weren't considered to be as effective as the initial movements. So at that time, Jiu-Jitsu went back to focusing on distracting the person in a way for them to then be able to take advantage and get the opponent in a grapple or lock for them to have control over. The ranking method with Jiu-Jitsu is you know, based off of the skill level and they are awarded different colors of belts. The most notable uh, practitioners are the Gracie family. And then there's Marcus Buchecha Almeida, who has a countless number of achievements, such as World Jiu-Jitsu Champ, Pan American Champion. The art of Jiu-Jitsu has not remained just a combative sport. It's very well spread throughout society, and it's in so many different films and shows. Um, it's very popular. And I think it's popular because it shows um, a more realistic approach to defense. Like I said before, most real fights uh, go to the ground very quickly, so by using jujitsu, it just seems a little more real, and uh, I think people can relate to that. The techniques that you learn um, make you feel very powerful um, because you can get out of certain situations and you realize that it's the technique that matters so much, you know. And obviously, if somebody's way bigger than you and they know technique as well, it's going to be a little different. But you have way more control knowing good technique as opposed to not knowing anything at all, obviously. Um, and I always think it's important, like I said, to have an understanding of self-defense. I'm always talking about this, and especially on the ground. So I think it's very important to learn some ground skills, and there are a few basic movements that you can learn that are fairly simple, such as bridging, shrimping, side mount, and, or escaping side mount, and standing guard pass. Um, you can work on all of those and actually um, just have a partner and you can learn some stuff off of YouTube. There's a lot of tutorials. Um, it's a really good workout because it's a full body workout when you're, you know, having to deal with somebody else's weight. It can be a very good workout. Um, so I would, you know, focus on like the basic moves of jujitsu and practice them and just get comfortable, um, you know, going through them and then maybe take a class. You might feel a little more comfortable after you've watched some videos on it. So all the movements incorporate grip, control, 
angles, momentum, and force, which allow it to be such a concise and disciplined skill to harness. So, like I said, those moves are fairly basic, but to master anything, you have to do it a lot, obviously. So, like I said, it's a really good workout and you can learn some self-defense at the same time. Another thing I love about jujitsu is it makes you realize how much of a shield or armor your body can be when you know how to use it properly, not just for attacking or um, doing cool moves. Like jujitsu is so cool to actually just protect yourself. Um, and I think that's more important than anything. Like we never want to fight. That's not what it's about. It's about learning how to defend yourself. And jujitsu is one of the best. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Please do leave your comments down below and add any additional information that you would like to. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do that now. And if you have, hit the notification bell and thank you for subscribing. If you want to subscribe to my email list, there's a link for you down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Welcome back to Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is wrestling. So wrestling is a sport that requires a ton of physical strength, technique, and stamina to control your opponent, uh, pin them down, grapple them down, obviously whatever is necessary to win. So wrestling is obviously a very popular sport and very well known, but most people might not know that it was actually introduced in the 19th century in Athens when the first modern Olympic games were held. It wasn't until the 20th century that wrestling became more of a household name and became very popular as a sport. But rather than be introduced in a formal setting such as the Olympics, it gained popularity as a freestyle competition. Wrestling then went on to become a very popular sport and entertainment for the world. So some of the roots of wrestling were actually traced back to several murals which spanned all across the globe. For example, there's an ancient Egyptian mural that dates back to 2000 BC which gives a little more evidence that wrestling has been around for a long time. To some, wrestling may seem like a very daunting sport or martial art because, you know, WWE and also the media. But wrestling is very intense and hard on your body and it's debated in the wrestling community that those types of injuries usually bring you closer to your religious beliefs. The use of religion in wrestling for gaining viewership has been a controversial move for wrestling for many years. Wrestling has several different branches. International wrestling, collegiate wrestling, sambo, professional wrestling. Of course there's a lot of wrestlers in mixed martial arts, MMA, and UFC. So MMA, um, WWE, and Raw are very mainstream branches of wrestling and really boost that fan base. Some notable names in the WWE are Steve Austin, The Rock, John Cena, just to name a few. And of course, there are a ton of wrestlers in the UFC. You know, I think wrestling is one of the best backgrounds to have, especially when you're in the UFC. It's such a solid structure, and it's so important to understand your opponent's weight and how you can manipulate that. So apart from having you know a large fan base and huge viewership um, on the sports channels wrestling has been incorporated into so many films a lot of WWE wrestlers or professional wrestlers have actually stepped into the acting world and one of the most you know famous is definitely The Rock Dwayne Johnson he's an inspiration to me I really look up to him and I love uh, everything he's done with his career I think he's very talented and yeah, remains humble which is so important. It's understandable that, you know, the WWE became so popular, it was super entertaining, you know, it's a fake fight on screen. <laughs> um, so growing up, I was such a, like, true hardcore martial artist, and I didn't like WWE because I was like, that's fake, it's so annoying, it's so fake, blah, 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 I was a little snob. Um, but really, it's, I mean, that's what entertainment is like that's what I do now I entertain with fake fights so it's funny how that came full circle but you know wrestling has been such an entertaining sport and martial art for so many years you know the wrestler with Mickey Rourke is such an awesome film wrestling is such an important martial art and it's such a wonderful foundation for 
arts like you know jujitsu and things like that. It's just really a great core foundation to understand body mechanics and weight distribution. And of course, I recommend it like I recommend all other martial arts. And I've said this before, but you know most fights go to the ground. So if you are ever in that situation, it's so great and important to understand a little bit of groundwork, being able to control your opponent as much as possible and defend yourself. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave additional comments down below, of course. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do so and go ahead and hit that notification bell if you have. There's a link for my email list down below if you want to subscribe to that as well. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. You don't have to be a tech YouTuber to get sweet deals on the stuff you find online. You just need to install Honey. Hey everyone, welcome back to Martial Arts History. The martial art for today is Kung Fu. Kung Fu consists of a fighting style series that has been around for a long time. So Kung Fu is a form of Chinese martial art, also known as Kung Fu and actually Wushu. Now the word Wushu here is used as an old name of Kung Fu. Wushu was once considered to fall under Kung Fu, but now it's considered as a separate art. Kung Fu was originated more than 4,000 years ago during the Xia Dynasty. Like many other cultures in China, martial arts came to be able to hunt more effectively and to be able to defend themselves. Evidence of martial techniques associated with soldiers and weapons can be found in history. It is said that Yellow Emperor Hongdi, who in 2698 BC acquired the throne, initiated the art formally, but actually he had invented a form of wrestling that was to be taught to the troops, named Jiao Di, or horn butting, which involved the use of horned helmets. Jiao Di was then improved with more striking techniques and then became a sport in 221 BC during the Qin Dynasty. In the beginning, Kung Fu was known as an elite art and only those with power um, and that status could practice, but now obviously it's opened up uh, to the general public, thankfully, and it's considered as a traditional sport and very common martial art. In modern times, Kung Fu has its unique existence in China as a traditional heritage and has greatly influenced the lives of many people. And of course, Kung Fu has a lot of philosophical and spiritual aspects and religion has always played an important role. Kung Fu was actually typically associated with Buddhism and incorporated a lot of the Buddhist meditations. Some Kung Fu practices and practitioners still focus on that. You know, a majority of Kung Fu masters have promoted the idea of their religion and philosophies and meditations based off of religions such as Taoism, Shintoism, and Hinduism. Kung Fu is not just about the amazing movements associated with it, it's also very embedded in Chinese philosophies. The best Kung Fu practitioners use both the mind and the body, moreover merging the mental and physical movements. Tao Yin, a martial arts technique, has been practiced by Taoist practitioners who were one of the Tai Chi Chuan progenitors in 500 BCE. In Chinese film, film in general, and television, there are many famous practitioners of Kung Fu because it not only looks really cool on film, but it's also a really fun martial art to practice. There are so many different elements and so many different styles within Kung Fu that are very, very enticing. <laughs> you know, some of the famous uh, movies with Kung Fu, The Five Deadly Venoms, uh, Kung Fu Hustle, <laughs> Iron Monkey, I mean Kung Fu Panda, we can go on and on and on. Obviously a really popular TV series, uh, Kung Fu with David Carradine. Influences of Kung Fu can be seen in movies, TV shows, and theater, and most importantly, Chinese opera. One of the best examples being the Beijing Opera, which is a very famous form of drama and represents the Chinese culture. And Kung Fu mainly originated in Shaolin temples where monks practiced Kung Fu for health and self-defense during their quest for enlightenment. Kung Fu is really a 
big group of styles and techniques. A number of Kung Fu styles employ weapons such as staff, spear, and sword. There's so many different styles um, related to different animals and so many different techniques. That's why Kung Fu is truly amazing. It is so broad and large and you can study it for a lifetime and still not know everything. Actually, I think that with everything in life, I think there's always something to learn. To be a master at anything doesn't mean you stop learning. I think you're forever learning because that's, that's the joy of life, right? I've personally studied Shaolin Kung Fu for many years and maybe that's the reason it's one of my favorite martial arts. I think it's so beautiful and um, if I have to perform something for film, I usually go to a few go-to Shaolin Kung Fu katas or forms because I really think they're beautiful. They show flexibility and strength and speed. I just really think Kung Fu overall is one of the funnest martial arts. I remember my dad, you know, who is my main martial arts instructor, would challenge me to create a form at least once a week based off of a random animal um, just to get that creativity going. And it's just super fun, it's very freeing, um, and to move in different ways that you don't naturally move is very exciting. So, you know, there's so many different styles you can try within Kung Fu, um, but most importantly, what I think is so great about Kung Fu is just the mentality and the philosophies um, behind the Chinese martial art. There's no intention of hurting one another. Um, the intention is really just to enlighten oneself and to have the best health and fitness possible. And of course, to be able to defend yourself like many martial arts. So it truly is a very fun martial art. Um, again, Shaolin Kung Fu is one of my favorites. So. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This concludes my martial arts history series for now. There are different series that I want to get into, um, but I hope that you enjoyed the education, you know, little snippets of different styles. Uh, I hope that it can help you decide maybe which martial art you want to train, um, because I'm always getting that question like, you know, hi Amy, I'm new to martial arts, I want to get into it, but I don't know where to start. And so I wanted to give this to everyone to give you a little history on, you know, not all the martial arts, there's so many more martial arts, and I'll get into that later, I promise. Um, but just, you know, a few of the most popular martial arts, and then a few martial arts that aren't very well known. And I hope you enjoyed it, learned some things, maybe got a little inspiration to go train, and I just really hope that you enjoyed these videos. And go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you have, please do hit that notification bell. And there's a link for you down below with my email list if you want to subscribe to that as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you later. history and um you know just for a fact that um for today is and you know the only reason why I did a martial arts process is to like you know volunteers to like learn a lot of martial arts you know it's like and um what's that um, um, martial arts history. The other, the other martial arts history channels. Um, human weapons, human weapons. And the only reason why I want to learn lots, of, lots about martial art is because, um, you know, I like martial arts better than you know <laughs> being myself as one. But um, the only reason how it got me into martial arts is um, I think the one on like Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, uh, others, others that I know about because it's a lot of fun things to practice for martial arts and um, you know it's a lot of fun things. And yeah, and, and yeah, a lot of people know martial arts and all that. But, 
I would like to, <laughs> and Chloe and I want to teach you how to like defend yourself against bullies and negative people. Because I know bullies are jerks and negative people are negative and people are assholes. But to, you know, if you want to learn love like much like, like myself, just watch one of the martial arts movies or TVs, how you, however you want to call it, uh, how to be more brutal, <laughs> brutal fighters, all of that, because I know for a fact that I would like to volunteer next time if I would become an action star or something like that. But yeah, I know I'm I'm a terrible I'm a terrible martial arts artist because. I've been practicing for a lot of times, but I don't know if I'm doing it right. Ask myself in the first person, and you know, yeah, it's very startling for me. So yeah, but um, that is from martial art history, from episode one to ten. Let me know what you think about this. Comment down below. What is your favorite martial art, and what is your what do you want to learn about martial arts? Let me know, comment down below, and yeah. I think that's going to be it. Somehow, somewhere, I'll try to do the bonus <laughs> next time. Maybe like a game or something, but yeah. I'll be seeing you next time, and yeah. Stay safe out there, and... Yeah, make sure you be careful out there because I know it's going to be a bad stuff for me, you know. But yeah, I'll see y'all next time for a bonus, maybe, but yeah. Peace. Oh, <laughs> and Tyler's is signing out.